XMRV is a virus that was created synthetically as an artifact in the laboratory. It came on cell lines. It's, it's terrible that this, you know, led to such a waste of resources. But the fact of the matter is, it also drew attention to the problem, and that's the silver lining. Now, why am I going to talk to you about zoonotic diseases? And the reason is that the vast majority of emerging infectious diseases originate in animals. I'm not saying that the key trigger for this disorder originated in animals, but we need to be able to focus in some, to some extent on anything that might be moving back and forth between the animal kingdom and, and human kind. Uh, and we do much of this work, and these are an example of a whole host of things uh, that really pays our bills in the Center for Infection and Immunity for the work that we do day to day in emerging infectious disease research. And that has led to the development of the tools which are critical for the work that we're now undertaking to understand the pathogenesis of CFS and AIDS. And there are an enormous number of new viruses yet to be discovered. This is the way in which we estimated this, working in Bangladesh, chiefly with bats, using a standard series of what was known as concepts, PCR partner sets. We were able to identify 55 viruses, 50 never seen before, and when we went back and examined what it would take to get a complete picture of what was present just in those bats alone, we were able to then extrapolate to the entire mammal kingdom, and that mammals, the entire kingdom of mammals, realizing that there are a minimum of 320,000 viruses yet to be discovered. If you have bacteria, it's even larger, and it will cost an enormous amount of money to, to sort this out. But as you can see here, the economic impact for emerging infectious diseases is substantial. Look at SARS, look at Ebola, look at these other things. All of this work that is now being done to explore acute infectious diseases is helpful to us for chronic diseases as well. The more we understand about bacteria and viruses and fungi and how they cause disease, the better able we will be to mine samples from humans with CFS and and other disorders to figure out what might be working there that might be responsible for causing disease. We use a number of different tools to try to investigate uh, what's present within a sample. Some of these are PCR methods that we know for many of you. Sometimes we use high frequency sequencing, increasingly we use high frequency sequencing. And what high frequency sequencing means, what this does, is it allows you to look at every single gene that's present within a sample. So whether it's coming from the human or it's coming from an animal, you are able to see it. And what you do is you compare the sequences that you obtain against the database of sequences which is derived from all the other work that we do in acute and chronic infectious diseases. And then you look for the prevalence of that particular finding in patients with CFSME, possibly caused by symptom complex, and that then gives you some insight into the role of that agent as a potential candidate for causing disease. The tools uh, for doing this kind of work are becoming uh, ever less expensive and more efficient. I began this work really with Roche 4x4 uh, in 2005. Now we have another. Uh, agent, another way to find agent using ion torrent, which is basically a pH meter hooked up to a sequencer and the lumina. And this now allows us to do the kind of work that used to take us years in a matter of months. And we can not only look at bacteria and viruses, but we can also examine markers that might be present in the blood or in the spinal fluid or in tissue from people with disease which gives us insight not only into the mechanism by which the disease might occur, but actual therapeutic targets. So ways in which you might be able to say, this particular gene is overexpressed. Perhaps we can find a drug that will adjust and modulate the level of expression of that gene, which can then lead to an intervention which would have therapeutic value. And key to that, of course, is sample collection. In addition to looking at genetic sequences of microorganisms, we're also trying to find some way in which we can evaluate the immunological history of people with various diseases. So by immunological history, I mean what is it somebody might have been exposed to remotely that might then trigger some sort of a, some sort of a response that then results in disease. So putting thinking about Ebola, for example, if you can demonstrate that somebody can previously exposed to Ebola, then they can safely work with patients with Ebola. 
If we can find an example of there's a group of patients who have a severe disease, and they then have the antibodies that are associated with, you know, some infectious agent, you know, maybe these are people with brain fog, maybe the people who don't have brain fog, maybe the people who have a rat disease, people who have night sweats, people who didn't have night sweats, you can begin to put together some sort of a picture that allows things to make sense. So although as a group, when we're seeking funding to do the work we need to do, it's important for us to all work underneath the same tent. When you begin to do the science, you need to begin to think about personalized medicine, ways in which we can address the specific problems of subgroups of people. And if you don't approach the science in that way, you may miss the opportunity to make links that can be informative. Think of cancer as a, as a paradigm. If you go back 100 years, cancer was cancer. Now we know there are different interventions for adenocida in the lung, or testicular cancer, or cervical cancer. They don't all have the same root, they don't have the same solutions, and they're all considered cancer, but there's a single cancer society. And what they do is they focus on getting resources, and that then allows the scientists who need to do the work and the clinicians who depend on the scientific results to choose the appropriate strategies for addressing particular problems. So it's important, I think, for you all to work together to develop this. We do, again, sort of, you know, we do work on emerging infections all over the world. This is an example of how we found out how people were becoming ill with MERS in Saudi Arabia. We implicated camels. You know, people said, what does that have to do with that? Well, the fact of the matter was, no one in the world would have paid for peptide microarray technology to be developed, just as nobody would have paid for cell phone technology to be developed, or flat screens, or so forth. But there would have been some other cultural need. In this case, much of this stuff is driven by the military and concerns, and this is the sort of the, the peace dividend, if you will, of the war investments that everybody seems to make. And we're exploiting these for your good. Now, this, this vignette is, is shown just to illustrate an important point. This was a, a condition that was first described in the UK by John Sidman in the 1600s. It's known as, it's named after him, uh, the epidemic of Sidman's career. And the idea here is that you develop antibodies to a very common bacterium. And that antibody then results in this neurological disorder. Not every human exposed to the hemolytic streptococcus, strep throat, develops this disorder, but people who are genetically predisposed to exaggerated immune disorders do. So what we've done here now is to take a mouse that's part of the autoimmunity, which is an STL mouse, and that animal then describes that sort of problem. We then identified what the antibodies in this mouse bound to. We went back in the kids who had this disorder and found that they reacted with the homologous protein, the same protein equivalent in humans as what we found in the mice. So although I said early on we tried, there are some caveats to using animal models. There are some ways in which we can use them too. And sometimes what looks like an infectious disease proves not to be. It proves to be an environmental toxin. So this is some work we did a few years ago looking at people who had an inflammatory process involving the peripheral nerves. So they simply did this. And this is something that some of you either have or know people who have. And what we learned, in fact, was that this was not an infectious disease at all, but as a result of exposure to central nervous system myelin, the insulating substance that surrounds nerves. 